Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can see me really well. Um, I think this is a great uh, opportunity, actually, to share some of my teaching. Uh, I teach on um, a sustainability degree, and so I'm really looking forward to sharing some of the key concepts that um, we've been studying there. Could we just get an idea? I'd just be really interested to find out what is it that you are interested in when it comes to sustainability? Um, could someone, could you just type in the chat, you know, is it about the fashion aspect that inspires you? Um, are you particularly reflecting on the state of the environment right now because of COVID-19? Has it come to the surface much more with you on account of what we are surrounded by right now? Yes, so I'm going to see your responses. When, would, when do we start measuring sustainability? Noah, could you kind of expand on that a bit more? Are you talking about fashion companies from seed to shelf or even before the seed? Okay, that's a really interesting point. Um, in fact, I'm uh, my focus is working with businesses and looking from start to finish. So we start with the raw materials. So I'm working with a farm, for instance, right now that produces wool. Um, and it's right from scratch. So we actually measure the the supply chain, the carbon footprint at every point. So it's from a uh, sourced gate, which means the gate is where it then goes off to the customers. So yes, I think measuring sustainability and the carbon footprint is critical. Irina, you're interested in sustainability in fashion and everyday life. Um, I'm hoping, and I wonder what you think about this, but I'm hoping that COVID-19 will get people changing their consumption habits because what we have right now is unsustainable hyperconsumption. I wonder if some of you have come across um, the, the theorist um, Giles Lipovetsky who talks about hyperconsumption and where we think that our lives will improve on account of what we purchase. So I'm hoping that COVID-19 does have some positive effects. Um, let's look further down. Fashion, uh, Margaret, the fashion aspect and style. Yes, Noah, do we look at the soil? Absolutely. We look at, in fact, one of the things that we're doing with this particular farm is that we have begun to regenerate the soil. So it used to be a monoculture before, but now what they're doing is they're beginning to look at putting different types of plants in there to regenerate that soil and bring the nitrogen back in there and the carbon back in. So I would, I'd love to keep in touch with you actually because I could share some of the research that we are beginning to do. Yes, regeneration, absolutely. It's about putting things back into the soil and really about that top soil, you know, that very top layer, which is very thin, uh, our entire survival depends on that. So um, it's really wonderful to actually get these responses from you guys. Uh, okay, right, so perhaps we could now, um, hi Victoria, I've just seen that you've joined us. We're just having a, a, a little chat about what is it that interests you about sustainability, just an icebreaker, really, and there are some wonderful things that are coming out of this. Um, so, we could start with a presentation. All right. So, I'll just give you a few moments to check on to the slide of my presentation. Right, so let me say a few things about myself. Um, 
I came as a fashion print designer at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and actually, I felt that I would continue to be a print designer within the fashion industry. But the way that events turned out, I, I moved from print. I went on to uh, study at the Royal College of Arts, which was just an incredible place uh, to be studying. I did a postgraduate course there. And I found that actually I had a real love of research. So I went on to um, find a sustainable way of fixing dyes to fiber using selective wavelengths of radiation. And that became my doctoral thesis. I did that at an engineering faculty at the University of Loughborough. It's got one of the leading mechanical engineering faculties. And I worked with laser machinery there. So it was quite a challenge, actually, going from originally a design school background, leaping into an engineering faculty, understanding the physics uh, of, um, of the laser, and beginning to really apply laser principles to the dry fixing. So currently what I do is that I work with students and I bring in industry where I'm very keen on this interlink between industry and students, making it relevant for them. And currently, for instance, I'm working with Patagonia. And one of the things that I asked Patagonia was, do you align yourself with the UN 2030 agenda? And they don't. And one of the things that I, I said was that, you know, it's not just companies, it's countries, entire countries are looking at this. 193 countries have signed up to this. So could we look at five of the UNSCP and ask our students to see how well aligned you are to those SDGs. So they gave us five that concerned them. And what turned out, I'm currently marking this work, is just a fascinating evaluation about what is lacking, what is missing. For instance, when it comes to producing a fleece, which is a polyester fleece made out of plastic bottles, uh, the research that we found was that a lot of these fibers end up at the bottom of the sea. They enter into the marine life and into the food chain. So should we actually be producing polyester fleeces? Should we, get a, should we put a stop to plastics altogether? So that's my background. What I was planning to cover in this session is to just give you kind of a positioning of where we are currently. Um, and to look at climate change and the warnings that we've had over the last 40 odd years. And then to look at this concept of biomimicry, which is really quite inspirational and how design can change by looking at nature. So these are the books. Uh, I thought it'd be really interesting for you to have a look at these books, particularly the one by Janine Benyus, which is really an inspiring she's an inspiring writer and she's one of the originators of the whole concept of biomimicry uh jeffrey Sachs is a fantastic writer he worked with the un so he's got first-hand knowledge and he's got a great way of explaining some of the difficult sustainable concepts and then sustainable businesses uh, a one planet approach is really looking at the nitty-gritty of how can you be a sustainable, how can you say that you're a sustainable company if you then continue to have exponential growth? So three inspiring books that I used in this presentation. So first, I want to take you uh, 40 years ago, take you right back uh, to 1972 and some of the warnings that scientists gave us but before we do that, I'd like you to watch a small clip. It's about five minutes long. It's a clip of what's been happening in terms of our planet and our resources. It's a beautiful animation. Mm-hmm. 
This is the Earth, as it looked 90 million years ago. Geologists call this period the Late Cretaceous. It was a time of extreme global warming, when dinosaurs still ruled the planet. They went up their lives, secure in their place at the top of the food chain. Oblivious to the changes taking place around them. The continents were drifting apart, opening huge rifts in the Earth's crust. They flooded, becoming seas. Algae thrived in the extreme heat, poisoning the water. They died and fell in their trillions to the bottom of the rifts. Rivers washed sediment into the seas until the organic remains of the algae were buried. As the pressure grew, so did the heat until a chemical reaction transformed the organic into hydrocarbon fossil fuels, oil, and natural gas. A similar process occurred on land, which produced coal. It took nature about 5 million years to create the fossil fuels that the world consumes in one year. The modern way of life is dependent on this fossilized sunlight, although a surprising number of people take it for granted. Since 1860, geologists have discovered over 2 trillion barrels of oil. Since then, the world has used approximately half. Before you can pump oil, you have to discover it. At first, it was easy to find and cheap to discover. The first great American oil field was Thingletop, discovered in 1900. Many more followed. Geologists scoured America. They found enormous deposits of oil, natural gas, and coal. America produced more oil than any other country, enabling it to become an industrial superpower. Once an oil well starts producing oil, it's only a matter of time before it enters a decline. Individual wells have different production rates. When many wells are averaged together, the combined graph looks like a bell curve. Typically, it takes 40 years after the peak of discovery for a country to reach its peak of production, after which it enters a permanent fall. In the 1950s, Shell geophysicist M. King Hubbard predicted that America's oil production would peak in 1970, 40 years after the peak of U.S. oil discovery. Few believed him. However, in 1970, American oil production peaked and entered a permanent decline. Hubbard was vindicated. From this point on, America would depend increasingly on imported oil. This made her vulnerable to supply disruptions and contributed to the economic mayhem of the 1973 and 1979 oil shocks. The 1930s saw the highest rate of oil discoveries in US history. In spite of advanced technology, the decline in the discovery of new American oil fields has been relentless. More recent finds, such as Anwar, would at best provide enough oil for 17 months. Even the new Jack 2 field in the Gulf of Mexico would only supply a few months of domestic demand. Though large, neither field comes close to satisfying America's energy requirements. Evidence is now mounting that world oil production is peaking, or is close to it. Globally, the rate of discovery of new oil fields peaked in the 1960s. Over 40 years later, the decline in discovery of new fields seems unstoppable. 54 of the 65 major oil-producing nations have already peaked in production. Many of the others are expected to follow in the near future. The world will need to bring the equivalent of a new Saudi Arabia into production every three years to make up for declining output in existing oil fields. In the 1960s, six barrels of oil were found for every one that was used. Four decades later, the world consumes between three and six barrels of oil for every one that it finds. Once the peak of world oil production is reached, 
Demand for oil will outstrip supply, and the price of gasoline will fluctuate wildly, affecting far more than the cost of filling a car. Modern cities are fossil fuel dependent. Even roads are made from asphalt, a petroleum product, as are the roofs of many homes. Large areas would be uninhabitable without heating in the winter. Okay. So, one of the questions I would like to ask you is, one of the questions I'd like to ask you right now, you've had a moment to watch this animation. Could you just cite some of the natural resources that were shown within the presentation and the causes of resource depletion? Could you put some could you put some responses in the chat? So could you put some res responses within the chat about the natural resources which the planet has got and what are the causes of the resource depletion? Yes, yes, as a natural resource. Yeah, oil, that's right. Yeah, overuse of oil, fossil fuel, absolutely, oil, gas, coal. Claudia, well done. Yeah, absolutely, water. Now, it's really interesting that when I go into the next slide, what I will show is what the researchers thought were the issues in 1972. So can you just let me know that you can hear me clearly? Just uh, let me know that you can. Okay, brilliant. So let's go on into the next slide. Now, 1972, the UN begins to realize that there are some issues concerning the environment and there's a a meeting that happens at that time, but at the same time, there are international scientists who come together and they begin to use software to try and forecast what's going to happen in the 21st century. Really interesting experiment. And what they find is that they, the, there will be challenges to the growth, the economic growth on the planet because they feel that the resources such as oil, gas, coal will dry out. Now that publication, that report became this particular book. It's a seminal text called The Limits to Growth. Really interesting that they felt it was that the running out of petroleum, petrochemicals, that would be the cause of economic growth coming to an end in the 21st century. And they came up with this idea of planetary boundaries. Since then, however, scientists have re-evaluated, reassessed their understanding of planetary boundaries and found that actually what's going to stop what's going to cause real problems on this planet are not the drying up of petrochemicals as yet, but rather the impact of human consumption of exponential economic growth on climate, on ocean acidification, on chemical pollution, on biodiversity. And this particular model that is in front of us was drawn up by John Rockstrom and other scientists at the Stockholm Research Center. And this was published in 2009. It's really interesting to see that we've already exceeded. So the red lines that emerge, the red cones that emerge show areas that we have already gone beyond the tipping point. Can anyone tell me what they understand by a tipping point? Thank you. Stockholm Resilience Centre. Thank you, Claudia. That's a, 
error. Um, can you tell me what you understand by a tipping point? What do you think these planetary boundaries might mean? What do you understand by a tipping point? Uh, a tipping point is where you go beyond a boundary where there's no return. And what we'll then begin to see is that there are some um, some um, well, we will begin to see things in the environment that actually are quite haphazard. Uh, so we'll begin to see uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, drought in famine in other areas, forest fires, all of that that it comes out of control. So, could you just type what you think the difference in understanding is between 40 years ago and what scientists have found out today? What do you think that realization is? Where are we at today? between 1972, when they used quite a crude um, software model and put all the factual information in and felt that they had understood what was going to happen in the 21st century, that actually it was the petrochemicals that were going to dry up. But we get to the 21st century and what scientists find is it's not the petro petrochemicals. Yes. The infinite Margaret, what you're saying there is that there was Yes, in a sense, people haven't listened. The factual information is there. But between 1972 and 2009 is, we see that it is our exponential growth and it is our economic activities that are having an impact on the planet. Those are the boundaries that are really risking our life on this planet. So here's where I'd like to introduce you to biomimicry. Um, the real genius behind biomimicry, apart from life, uh, nature being the genius, is also the scientist called Janine Benius. So she's a natural science writer. And I love this bit, what she talks about her own degree in applied science. I think it's really interesting, you know, when I speak to students about, about their degrees and what they go on to do later on in life. I'd like you to take a moment to read this quote about what she says about what she learned on her degree in forestry in applied science. So it's really interesting in this quote, she goes on to study forestry, but they don't feel that there is much to learn, that humans can learn much from nature, that it could not add value to that. So I'm going to show you a, a clip of her speaking on a TED talk. It's really inspiring. I'd really encourage you to find out more about her. And here she introduces this concept of biomimicry. If I could reveal anything that is hidden from us, at least in modern cultures, it would be to reveal something that we've forgotten, that we used to know as well as we knew our own names. And that is that we live in a competent universe, that we are part of a brilliant planet, and that we are surrounded by genius. Biomimicry is a new discipline 
that tries to learn from those geniuses and take advice from them, design advice. That's where I live. And it's my uh, university as well. I'm surrounded by genius. I cannot help but remember um, the organisms and the ecosystems that know how to live here gracefully on this planet. This is what I would tell you to remember if you ever forget this again. Remember this. This is what happens every year. This is what keeps its promise. While we're doing bailouts, this is what happened. Spring. Imagine designing spring. Imagine that orchestration. You think Ted is hard to organize, right? Imagine, and if you haven't done this in a while, do. Imagine the timing, the coordination, all without top-down laws or policies or climate change protocols. This happens every year. There's lots of showing off. There's lots of love in the air. There's lots of grand openings. And the organisms, I promise you, have all of their priorities in order. I have this neighbor that keeps me in touch with this because he's living usually on his back looking up at those grasses. And one time he came up to me, he was about seven or eight years old, he came up to me and there was a wasp's nest that I had let grow in my yard and right outside my door. And most people knock them down when they're small, but it was fascinating to me because I was looking at this sort of fine Italian end papers. And he came up to me and he knocked. He would come every day with something to show me and he'd like knock like a woodpecker on my door until I opened it up. And he asked me how I had made the house for those wasps. Because he had never seen one this big. And I told him, you know, Cody, the wasps actually made that. And we looked at it together. And I could see why he thought, you know, it was so beautifully done. It was so architectural. It was so precise. But it occurred to me how in his small life had he already believed the myth that if something was that well done, that we must have done it. How did he not know, it's what we've all forgotten, that we're not the first ones to build. You know, we're not the first ones to process cellulose. We're not the first ones to make paper. We're not the first ones to try to optimize packing space or to waterproof or to try to heat and cool a structure. We're not the first ones to build houses for our young. What's happening now in this field called biomimicry is that people are beginning to remember that organisms, other organisms, the rest of the natural world, are doing things very similar to what we need to do. But in fact, they're doing them in a way that have allowed them to live gracefully on this planet for billions of years. So these people, biomimics, are nature's apprentices. And they're focusing on function. What I'd like to do is show you a few of the things that they're learning. They have asked themselves, what if every time I started to invent something, I asked how would nature solve this? And here's what they're learning. This is an amazing picture from a Czech photographer named Jack Headley. This is a story about an engineer at J.R. West. They're the people who make the bullet train. It was called the bullet train because it was rounded in front, but every time it went into a tunnel, it would build up a pressure wave, and then it would create like a sonic boom when it exited. So the engineer's boss said, find a way to quiet this train. He happened to be a birder. He went to the equivalent of an Audubon Society meeting, and he studied, there was a film about kingfishers, and he thought to himself, they go from one density of medium, the air, into another density of medium, water, without a splash. Look at this picture, without a splash, so that they can see the fish. And he thought, what if we do this? Quieted the train, 
made it go 10% faster on 15% less electricity. How does nature repel bacteria? We're not the first ones to have to protect ourselves from some bacteria. Turns out that this is a Galapagos shark. It has no bacteria on its surface, no fouling on its surface, no barnacles. And it's not because it goes fast. It actually basks. It's a slow-moving shark. So how does it keep its body free of bacteria buildup? It doesn't do it with a chemical. It does, it turns out, with the same dentosols that you had, you know, in, in, on Speedo bathing suits that broke all those records in the Olympics. But it's a particular kind of pattern. And that pattern, the architecture of that pattern on its skin dentosols, keep bacteria from being able to land and adhere. There's a company called Sharklet Technologies that's now putting this on the surfaces in hospitals to keep bacteria from landing, which is better than dousing it with antibacterials or harsh cleansers that many, many organisms are now becoming drug resistant. Hospital acquired infections are now killing more people every year in the United States than die from AIDS or cancer or car accidents combined, about 100,000. This is a little critter that's in the Namibian desert, has no fresh water that it's able to drink, but it drinks water out of fog. It's got bumps on the back of its wing covers, and those bumps act like a magnet for water. They have water-loving tips and waxy sides. And the fog comes in and it builds up on the tips, and then it goes down the sides and into the critter's mouth. There's actually a scientist here at Oxford uh, who studied this, Andrew Parker. Um, and now kinetic and architectural firms like Grimshaw are starting to look at this as a way of coating buildings so that they gather water from fog. Ten times better than our fog catching nets. CO2 as a building block. Organisms don't think of CO2 as a poison. Plants and organisms that make shells, coral, think of it as a building block. There's now a cement manufacturing uh, company starting in the United States called Calera. They've borrowed the recipe from the coral reef, and they're using CO2 as a building block in cement, in concrete. Instead of cement usually emits a ton of CO2 for every ton of cement, now it's reversing that equation and actually sequestering half a ton of CO2, thanks to the recipe from the coral. None of these are using the organisms. They're really only using the blueprints of the recipes from the organisms. How does nature gather the sun's energy? This is a new kind of solar cell that's based on how a leaf works. It's self-assembling. It can be put down on any substrate whatsoever. It's extremely inexpensive and rechargeable every five years. It's actually a company that I'm involved in called One Sun with Paul Hawkins. There are many, many ways that nature filters water, that takes salt out of water. We take water and we push it against a membrane, and then we wonder why the membrane clogs and why it takes so much electricity. Nature does something much more elegant, and it's in every cell, every red blood cell of your body right now has these hourglass-shaped pores called aquaporins. They actually export water molecules through. It's kind of a forward osmosis. They export water molecules through and leave solutes on the other side. A company called Aquaporin is starting to make desalination membranes, mimicking this technology. Trees and bones are constantly reforming themselves along lines of stress. This algorithm has been put into a software program that's now being used to make bridges lightweight, to make building beams lightweight. Actually, GM Opal used it to create um, that, that skeleton you see in what's called their bionic car. It lightweighted that skeleton using the minimum amount of material as an organism must for the maximum amount of strength. This beetle... <laughs> Unlike this chip bag here, this beetle uses one material, chitin, and it finds many, many ways to put many functions into it. It's waterproof. It's strong and resilient. It's breathable. It creates color through structure, whereas that chip bag has about seven layers to do all of those things. One of our major inventions that we need to be able to do to come even close to what these organisms can do is to 
find a way to minimize the amount of material, the kind of material we use, and to add design to it. We use five polymers in the natural world to do everything that you see. In our world, we use about 350 polymers to make all this. Nature is nano. Nanotechnology, nanoparticles, you hear a lot of worry about this, loose nanoparticles. What is really interesting to me is that not many people have been asking, how can we consult nature about how to make nanotechnology safe? Nature's been doing that for a long time, embedding nanoparticles in a material, for instance, always. In fact, sulfur-reducing bacteria, as part of their synthesis, they will emit as a byproduct nanoparticles into the water. But then right after that, they emit a protein that actually gathers and aggregates those nanoparticles so that they fall out of solution. Energy use. Organisms sip energy because they have to work or barter for every single bit that they get. And one of the largest fields right now in the world of energy grids, you hear about the smart grid, one of the largest consultants are the social insects, swarm technology. There's a company called Regen. They're looking at how um, ants and bees find their food and their flowers in the most effective way as a whole hive. And they're having appliances in your home talk to one another through that algorithm and determine how to minimize peak power use. There's a group of scientists in Cornell that are making what they call a synthetic tree because they're saying, you know, there's no pump at the bottom of a tree. It's capillary action and transpiration pulls water up a drop at a time, pulling it, releasing it from a leaf and pulling it up through the roots. And they're creating, you can think of it as a kind of wallpaper. They're thinking about putting it on the insides of buildings to move water up without pumps. Amazon electric eel, incredibly endangered some of these species, creates 600 volts of electricity with the chemicals that are in your body. Even more interesting to me is that 600 volts doesn't fry it. You know, we use PVC and we, we sheathe wires with PVC for insulation. These organisms, how are they insulating against their own electric charge? These are some questions that we've yet to ask. Here's a wind turbine manufacturer that went to a whale. Humpback whale has scalloped edges on its flippers. And those scalloped edges play with flow in such a way that it reduces drag by 32%. These wind turbines can rotate in incredibly slow wind speeds as a result. MIT just has a new radio chip that uses far less power than our chips. And it's based on the cochlear of your ear, able to pick up internet, wireless, television signals, and radio signals in the same chip. Finally, on an ecosystem scale, at Biomimicry Guild, which is my consulting company, we work with HOK Architects, we're looking at building whole cities in their, in their planning department. And what we're saying is that shouldn't our cities do at least as well in terms of ecosystem services as the native systems that they replace? So we're creating something called ecological performance standards that hold cities to this higher bar. The question is, biomimicry is an incredibly powerful way to innovate. The question I would ask is, what's worth solving? If you haven't seen this, it's pretty amazing. Dr. Adam Neiman. This is a depiction of all the water on Earth in relation to the volume of the Earth. All the ice, all the fresh water, all the seawater, and all the atmosphere that we can breathe in relation to the volume of the Earth. And inside those walls, life over 3.8 billion years has made a lush, livable place for us. Okay. So, really inspiring um, scientist and writer. So her book is really beautiful to read. I sometimes wonder, you know, if we were taught by 
scientists who are passionate, biologists who are passionate about their subject, we would all be going into this particular arena. So just to look at some of the things that she said in much greater detail. So where does biomimicry come from? It's Greek origin in terms of bios you know, or life and mimesis as imitation. Now, she breaks it down into three points. Nature as a model. Nature as a measure because of the amount of years that it has survived, 3.8 billion years of evolution. And nature, nature as a mentor because it has got things right over that time. Some of it has not worked out, but then it hasn't survived time. So how does it become a mentor? There are three different levels as well at which this works. So if you look at natural form, this is where you consider, for instance, the a lotus leaf, uh, where you're looking at the very structure of it and you mimic the surface of a lotus leaf so that your product becomes self-cleaning. That's where you're looking at form and not necessarily looking at using a natural raw material. When you look at nature as a process, it's really interesting where you might look at how ants communicate amongst themselves and then look at how that sort of communication might be brought into software and autonomous cars and the way that they communicate with each other. And finally, nature as an ecosystem. You would have probably come across, for instance, uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation that's been talking a lot about the circular economy. Well, it's about nature having zero waste. So there's nothing that ends up in a landfill site because it ends up in the body of another insect or another plant or another tree. And how might we mimic that? I want to just cite some of the examples of biomimicry uh, in fashion and outside of fashion as well. So this is in 1941. We see that George Demestro, who's a Swiss inventor, goes for a walk and finds that I'm sure you come across this where you go for a walk in the woods and you come back with these burrs, which are really annoying, that stick to your, to your clothes. And he then investigated that further. And after lots of trials and testing, he came up with a nylon, which he heat treated, and it consisted of loops. And when he cut those heat treated nylon loops, he formed these hooks which then he patented as Velcro. So essentially, it became a zipperless zipper. And this was invented in 1955 when he got the patent for it. This is the example that Jane Benyus talked about, but I thought it would be really interesting to go into this with, in greater detail. This is the Japanese Shinkansen. Uh, an innovation that was inspired by nature. And as she said, it's the speed where it goes at 320 kilometers an hour. It's got overhead wires. And the problem, as she cited, was that the overhead wires caused a lot of noise. But also, as the engine, as the train emerges from the tunnel, there is this sound that a sonic boom that emerges and obviously disturbs everybody living in the vicinity. So the architect, who's um, Eiji Nakatsu, who is a keen bird watcher, looked at owls and um, kingfishers and how they, they behave in nature. So I'm going to just show you the, the train to begin with and then look much more closely at how owls behave.
Okay, so let's have a look at how owls behave in flight. This owl is an ambush hunter. What makes her so deadly? She's not the fastest, but she has a different advantage. It's stealth, not speed, that makes her lethal. Compare this owl to a falcon. Both animals are birds of prey, but they have really different strategies when it comes to hunting. The falcon hunts when it's light out. He's incredibly fast. Some falcons fly up to 200 miles per hour. They don't need to be quiet. By the time their prey hears them, it's already too late. But owls have another strategy. They hunt under the cover of darkness. They're sneaky. She has incredibly powerful night vision, and she can zero in on the location of even the smallest noise. Air rushes over her wings as she flies. In most birds, that's noisy, but with owls, there's almost no flapping sound, no rustling. It's quiet. Up close, you can see how she does it. Her feathers are velvety, soft. That furriness lets the feathers slip quietly past each other during flight, damp and sound like a soft blanket. Compare that to falcon feathers. They're sleek and aerodynamic, but noisy as they slice through the air. And here's another thing. See those projections along the leading edge of the owl's wing, like a pointy comb? Those break up the wind as it flows over the top of the wing. The feathers at the trailing edge of the wing break up the wind even more. Compared to a falcon, these feathers look kind of jagged, right? But that jaggedness means almost no whooshing sound that would alert their prey. And overall, owl wings are bigger, wider than a pointy falcon wing. So they're slower, but they have more lift. The owl doesn't need to flap them as often. Less flapping means less noise. We often fear what's fast, speed, and danger seem to go hand in hand. But owls have given up on racing through the day to become champions of sneaking through the night. Isn't that just beautiful? Well, what's really interesting about the kingfisher, just looking at this image of it diving in, when it plunges in towards its prey, it pulls back its wings to form a streamlined shape that can cut through the water. But also its eyelids are opaque, so an opaque eyelid pulls over its eyes to protect it. The bird grabs the fish with its bill then buoyancy and a few wing flaps brings it back to the surface. So moving on, um, I'd really like to focus on the geometry that is within nature. I found this quite remarkable that in 1638, the French philosopher René Descartes dubbed the snail shell spiral, the equiangular spiral. And what we found is that there is a ratio which is called the golden ratio. And this is one to 1.618. And this kind of swirling geometry and the golden ratio has been used by architects to get perfect form within their buildings. And in this next slide, I want to show you how an engineer has used that to effect. Einstein said that essentially for something to exist, it must be moving. So every single thing in this universe is moving. The interesting thing is that all of that movement in nature has a particular spiraling path. Nature never ever moves in a straight line, no such thing. So that is nature's streamlining principle. When I froze the whirlpool that you see in your bathtub, you pull the plug out, there's the whirlpool. If you freeze that whirlpool, it's exactly the same geometry as a hurricane or a tornado or any other spiral or cochlea of your ear. This shape is archetypal in nature. And so when I froze this, I was then able to rotate it and create. Because I had a frozen whirlpool, I was able to create a whirlpool. So one of the first things that I used it on, 
and particularly in America, there are great big holding tanks. Well, that water gets stagnant. The municipalities that manage that water have to put chlorine and, and chlorines into the water. The problem is better solved by mixing that water. Generally, throughout the world, if you want to mix water, it's very expensive. I put one of these frozen whirlpools in the bottom of one of these tanks, six inches high, four inches wide, and I rotated it with a couple of hundred watts of power, a couple of light bulbs of power, and I found it was able to mix an entire tank of water, 10 million gallons, which, from an engineering point of view, is not even conceivably possible. So from there, I started adapting these shapes into fans. Fans use 18% of the world's electrical energy. They're not terribly efficient. We found time and time again, we could take the best fan in the world and reduce its energy by as much as 30%. So pretty much everything in an industrial world can be improved by taking these shapes from nature and reconfiguring what engineers build today. Okay, so I thought it would be really interesting for us to now begin to focus on fashion because a, a number of us have come from the fashion industry and are interested to see how things can change here. So the first one is where Nature actually is used by designers like Alexander McQueen. Many of you, did you just give me a kind of an idea? Did anyone get to see the retrospective exhibition about him at the Victoria and Albert Museum? You might have seen a lot of these uh, inspirations that he had uh, from nature because he was a real keen nature watcher. So. Give me an idea. Did anyone see that exhibition, which was probably about two, three years ago? It was quite ground, groundbreaking. Okay, so it was quite um, an amazing uh, kind of going into his mind and to the amount of research that he did. And one of the things was that he was very much inspired, not just by plants and forests, and and uh, but also by animals and kind of the animal within us comes through in some of his collections. But another designer that you must be very familiar with is actually Junya Watanabe. And if you could take a look at his autumn winter 2001, 2001 collection, you will see that he designed a voluminous skirt made from complex honeycomb structure that was polyester that created this delicate sculptural silhouette, like this image of Studio Esslinger that's in front of us. And the skirt packs completely flat. When worn, it expands to cover this three-dimensional effect. So fashion has used it in terms of color, texture, surface treatment. But also, it's really interesting that when it comes to sportswear, a lot of the companies like Speedo, Adidas, Nike, all of these companies have a really good research development department. There's a lot of money that goes into it. And here, what they looked at was the surface of the shark skin and to see if they could mimic the ridges on the surface and to enhance the flow of water over it and give even a millisecond advantage to these swimmers. And this was in Sydney 2000. And I know that these kind of fabrics were banned because they were fearful of competitors um, being left behind. Hydrophobic lotus, really interesting when you look at the microscopic image of a lotus leaf. What you see is this jagged surface texture, rough exterior, which limits contact and the adhesive force between the leaf and whatever lies on its surface. So when water droplets slide off the plant, it actually carries away with it the dust and the liquid that's settled on the leaf. Now, really interesting, Shola, one of the companies that I've had the pleasure of meeting up with, they're really inspirational. They produced a plant-inspired water and dirt repellent self-cleaning finish. Penguins, um, really interesting about the feathers when it comes to insulation, both in air and in water. What they found was that 
when compressed immediately gains loft and researchers are in the process, bioengineers are in the process of studying its structure and creating apparel from this. Spider silk, you might have heard a lot about spider silk actually, that it is tougher than steel, strongest per unit weight, and that it is pliable, 10 times more elastic than Kevlar. So currently they're working on designing armored gear with this, this silk thread. Okay, so we've come to the end of this session and I'd, I'd really love to get some feedback from you and have a discussion about it. So I'm going to come out of this presentation and share my screen with you. Okay. Can you hear me clearly? So what are, what are the particular aspects that uh, inspired you, that interested you from this presentation? Yes, the biomimicry solutions. Yes, was there one in particular that you felt really, I, I, I must admit, I personally found the idea of an engineer who was designing trains and happened to be a bird watcher being inspired by, you know, then looking at how is it that a kingfisher can enter from the air, different densities into water not cause a single splash, how can we bring that into the design of a train? I think that's super inspiring. Yes, the genius of nature and design coming together. I think fashion, where do, where do you think fashion, because a lot of us are in the fashion industry as well, where do you think fashion could bring more of uh, nature into it? Yeah. Do you think shark skin in terms of if it is for more of a medical solution, where do you think that surface effect would be beneficial, Claudia? And no, I agree about circularity. Um, when you talk about circularity and fashion, what comes to mind? How might we become much more circular with our clothing? How can fashion brands become much more circular? Yes, Claudia, that's a really interesting point about self, self cleaning surfaces, particularly for this time, right? We've been uh, talking about certainly in Britain about having uh, running out of a lot of equipment and people have been sewing garments. Wouldn't have it, that been amazing if we had a self cleaning surface for at this particular time? Nature has no waste, that's right, zero waste. Um, no, our finding solutions for end of life using materials that are comparable, creating as less waste as possible. Yes, I think if we could, what do you, what do you think of this idea about doing away with polyester and plastics altogether? and really focusing on biodegradable, if there is a plastic that is biodegradable, and focusing more on natural fibers. What do you, what do you think about that? Compostable, yeah, absolutely, compostable fibers. One of my students actually reported on a nylon that has been made compostable. I don't know much about that fiber. I'm, I'm puzzled as to think, how can it be both man-made, synthetic, and compostable? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I just want to uh, intrude for, for, with one thing. Perhaps for discussion, we can, um, whoever speaks can turn on the camera and microphone so we can have a little bit more life and, and see each other yeah. when we talk. Yeah, absolutely, that would be great. Yeah, let's do that. So, um, 
Claudia, would you like to put your mic on and, and give a few comments about your own take on this? Can you give us an idea of what your background is, Claudia? Or Noah, would you like to feedback? Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Hi Sorry for too many comments. <laughs> no, no, that's really interesting. Thank you. I am a sustainability consultant from Ukraine. Okay. Uh, and uh, my background is that uh, I'm a graduate of Stockholm Residence Centre. Oh, this is it. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that, that's right. Sorry for this uh, slight correction. No. But um, actually, thank you very much for this webinar. Um, many of the examples I have heard before, but many of them were new for me. So, uh, a great gratitude to, to you and to the colleagues for inputting and uh, sharing horizons uh, in the environmental Chris here. Yeah. Uh, which particular interests me is uh, really the impact on the medical sphere of the biomimicry since uh, I, I have read a lot of articles connected to, to uh, this uh, sharp skin and uh, I see that uh, no further um, actions have been taken into yeah. testing it and uh, unfortunately it was stopped this uh, research uh, in the sphere uh, and I wonder why because uh, at this current moment you were right that uh, is it the right time to, to introduce this solution yeah it's the one point which was interesting for me for discussion and another one is uh, connecting with the sustainable fashion since uh, I have a client in the fashion industry and we're constantly discussing different possible innovative materials to, to introduce yeah. So, so thank you for giving some hints um, where to look to. Yes, but in terms of um, certainly uh, in the projects that I've been doing with Patagonia and so on, I feel that we cannot continue to keep using plastics, you know. Even if we say that we are recycling uh, plastic bottles, there's a company that's going to be producing more plastic bottles, you know. So in a sense, we've got to Call it call it a day with this with plastics particularly. What do what do people think about this? Kind of give me an idea. What do you think about this? Do you feel that we can continue to produce plastic bottles in the numbers that we do, uh, or do we challenge companies like Coca Cola to stop using plastic bottles and we start a different culture of refilling uh, glass bottles, you know, or others? Uh, a, a good alternative. Okay, so Ira, you've um, mentioned Sharper Technologies, which is a US company that creates medical surfaces based on shark skin. So that's really interesting, Claudia, for you to have a look at. Um, that would be worth focusing on. Would anybody else as well like to join in and give some feedback? Ira, could you, give you, a, could you tell us what your background is in? Thank you, Claudia. Ira, do you come from a sustainable background? What's your background in particular? Can we can we unmute Ira? Soil scientist. Okay. What aspect of this uh, presentation particularly interested you in terms of um, soil? What's, what particularly, that's fine if it's, it's particularly noisy. What, what particular aspect of this presentation influenced you? Not the response from Ira as yet. Um, no, you do a lot of work with highlighting sustainability. Okay, just going back to Ira, you like the examples? Yes, you've got to think more about how soils and perhaps there are things that we can learn 
about how soil behaves that could be brought back into design. Really interesting, I don't know if some of you have read about the root system that is underground and how well connected root systems are. Um, it's a wonderful book um, on, on trees um, that was produced by a German forester that talked about the sort of communication that is produced by trees when they are being attacked by a virus or by insects or even by animals and the kind of um, kind of the chemicals that it releases and then warns other trees of the same type to take cover. So I think there have been some really great responses during this time. I'm glad that this has inspired you. We are planning to have more of these sessions and more discussions. Perhaps I think, Noah, it's really interesting what you brought up about uh, measuring the sustainability in terms of the carbon footprint. And certainly that's one of the things that I would like to share with you in a future session where we work with, we bring the business that we're working with and we share that and how we've broken down the supply chain and measured uh, the carbon footprint. Oh. So, <laughs> so is this Katrina? It's Noah. <laughs> oh, wow. Hi, Noah. Okay. How so, are you? First of all, thank you so, so much for this uh, amazing um, panel, lecture, whatever. It's, oh, that's it's wonderful. So awesome. That's great. I'm so thrilled. I'm so thrilled you came on board because I heard so much about you. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I really enjoyed um, learning from you because um, this field is super interesting to me. I'm talking about not just sustainable fashion, it's, but it's much more niche than that. So I'm talking all about vegan ethical sustainable fashion. <laughs> so it's yeah. like super, super uh, limit like even more niche than that. Yeah. Um, and in my field, um, there are up and coming innovations because like this whole thing came to me uh, to be interesting to me because of animal rights. Um, yeah. And, and um, there are so many amazing innovations that are coming up that are, you know, vegan and uh, yeah. eco friendly, but, may, but uh, for example, leathers that are, uh, you know, uh, yeah. fruit, yeah. fruit waste based yeah. or things like that. But, but many of them are also like relying on a percentage of polymers or plastic. Yes, yes. I understand. So, so uh, while they are using, uh, you know, they're trying to make everything better, for example, apple leather, which is made out of apple waste, yeah. can be 40 to 60% apple powder, but then right. the other 40% to 50% are made with bio-based PU, but it's yeah. still, you know, Plastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, to me, I mean, like ethic ethics wise, it's much better. And also, when you look at the carbon footprint that eventually comes from growing those animals and the water consumption and the land and everything, it is it has less of an impact, but it still doesn't make it perfect. Yeah. So. And um, in fact, I know of a company, Noah, which I can put you in touch with. Uh, I, I interviewed them a, a, a year ago, and one of my students went to work for them as well. And they're called Bourgeois Bohem, and they're based in London. I know. And they... oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Brilliant. They're so... making shoes for out of Pinotex, which That's is super right. cool. And um, so then they mentioned the apple fiber as well, and this the very same question I asked them was, what that, what's the polymer that holds the fiber together? What's it made of? And she said at the time that it was synthetic, but they were looking at a uh, natural form. Yeah. Yeah, Pinotex, I know for sure, are looking for a compostable, but I'm like research, researching it all the time. So I'm um, okay. trying to, to keep on top of things. Uh, so Pinotex is made out of 85% pineapple. Okay. Um, which is 
a big amount, but yeah, yeah. it's mixed with with some uh, some plastic in it. And for example, apple leather and grape leather are backed with organic cotton, uh, which is much better than than wow. uh, polymers. Uh, but they're still mixed to make them, you know, um, um, stable. Resistant. Yeah, stable, right. resistant. And um, from what, from my experience with these materials, they're holding up re really well. Like they, okay. they they pass the test of, of time, I guess. I mean, I I have them for two years now, and they still look amazing. Wow. Also, cork. There are like yeah. eighty eighty five percent, eighty five percent. Yeah, eighty or ninety five percent of cork is backed with polymers. Right. Uh, but the other percentage is back with cotton which makes it much more sustainable yeah yeah her busting the trees doesn't harm them it actually helps the, our planet which is super interesting because when you um harvest like taking that that oak of the of the cork or oak, yeah. it's yeah. actually helping the tree to produce more co2 okay like, like, more so, yeah it's That's really interesting. Helping the planet in a way, but yeah, yeah, there's there's so much to it, and I'm always thinking like this is that question that I'm uh, I was asking you before. Um, I'm always like thinking to myself, how do I how where do I start measuring this like sustainability, and where does it end? Because I feel like there's no not really a start and finish to this thing in a way. Okay, so it's really interesting that. Uh, what we, we do is that we set boundaries, otherwise it becomes unmanageable, you know. Yeah. So you, you've got to decide, uh, are you starting, imagine that you're actually working with somebody who produces that apple leather, you know. What you could do is ask them, do you produce the apple leather yourself? Does it come from a farm? You don't, what you manage is what happens within that factory. You don't consider beyond that factory because you've got to do something that's manageable within. So the distances that you cover, those other companies who are supplying will take that into account for their carbon footprint. But what you do is within that farm, imagine they produce the apple, they pulp it, and they then uh, combine it together with a polymer. All of that is happening on the, in that uh, those premises. Then what you look at are the... Uh, the electricity that goes into making it, you know. Yes, uh, I always like ask, uh, like, for example, when I work with a brand, I ask them about the water consumption, the energy, yeah, everything that goes right. into that production, but also like, like, from like I'm looking at sustainability from three different like points of view. Right. First of all, is the social one. Um, yeah. making sure that the people are treated well and, uh, and it's not starting just from the production itself but actually from sourcing um, yeah. so I'm looking at that and looking at you know other things as well the environment as well so, so one of the things that we are looking at is um, you know that here's an argument we were looking at you know Patagonia produces a lot of its clothes in a developing country, right? Yeah. So, so in a sense, there are a lot of these companies that are green, that are producing their clothes, not in an industrialized country, but in a developing country. Yeah. Which means that, like it or not, you're still paying a much lower wage. Yeah. Right? And so what the UN has suggested in its 2030 uh, sustainable goals is... Why don't you go back and invest in that country, in, in their sciences, in their education, so that you raise them up, you know, instead of following what is a tired and tested fast fashion model? Yes, I feel like this is why the UN set goal number one is no poverty. Um, yeah. Um, so it's obviously such an important thing. And right now, when you're looking at it from today's perspective with COVID, and you see yeah. how many brands, like fast fashion brands, are just 
you know, not taking responsibility and just not paying for orders that were already made by these people and they're now wow. staff. So, um, yeah. it's living, so millions of people without work and, yeah. Yeah, in Bangladesh and places like that, which depend for most of their economy on, on fast fashion, you know. Um, but what we are beginning to challenge is you cannot continue to grow exponentially and be a billion pound company year in, year out, your growth increases and say that you're sustainable because yeah. you're using valuable resources, you know. Yeah. So we, I feel like it's overused. That this term sustainability yeah, became a more theme. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to also like uh, with my work make sure people understand the terms like transparency and ethics, yeah. sustainability, and slow. Like what does it just yeah. mean? Because just people, you know, use those. Yeah, I think, I think on the whole. Uh, I think we need to educate people much more about the truths. There's a lot of clean washing and green washing, you yes. know? Yes. And we've got to now that with this particular pandemic as well, going forward, I think we've got to really get fashion companies responsible for what they do and get Absolutely. away with. The thing that I was doing during Fashion Revolution Week, which was two weeks ago, something like that, was when H&M, uh, so basically Fashion Revolution posts its uh, sustainable uh, transparency index every single year. And they're right. testing the, the biggest 250 fashion brands in the market, uh, in the world, basically. Yeah. And they see how much information they, they actually give about themselves. Bad right. or good. <laughs> right, um, and H and M ranks number one with the highest score for transparency, and they basically called themselves the most transparent brand in the whole entire world in front of their customers, yeah. which was completely misleading <laughs> and everything like that. And then yeah. this huge wave of people that are not understanding what transparency yeah. means were buying it into this lie and also yeah. people in our industry were like yeah. oh how did they rank so high for transparency yeah. how is it possible when yes. they don't understand what sustainability means so it's so important to like because yeah. this is a tool for greenwashing when people yeah. don't understand what it means so yeah, yeah. Okay. i would like, say to what i would say to people like h&m is you know just because you use organic cotton doesn't mean that you're green, you know? Exactly. How much, you know, even organic, even co organic cotton is a water guzzler. It uses masses of water, but also because you don't use pesticides, it means that you have got to use more land because you've got to grow more in order to get that same harvest. Yeah. Uh, and I would, also, I would also challenge them on how much do you pay your weight? What wages do you pay your workers? Do you trust guts for that your own your own thinking you mean no GOTS uh, got certified cotton oh I see okay I didn't I didn't know about that yeah so basically it's like this initiative that is checking on organic cotton and okay. making sure that the farmers are fairly like paid and there's no child labor okay. and right. that it's grown like it's like this I it up, actually yeah that's fantastic yes that so, is really revolutionary because that's one of the things that has really concerned me about organic and conventional cotton and people uh flower you know using that term all the time look at the amount of work yes. they're doing you know yes so i feel like like there are initiatives that we can look up to yes for example, and there yeah. are like alternatives that are coming up and coming, like the ones that it's from your use, for example, Tencel, um, yes. which is wood pulp, and it's not yeah. a so-called more natural fiber, but it's still very sustainable because yeah. of many things. But I feel like um, I, I was talking with, with from Yore about it 
um, on my on my panel thing that I did with them about transparency and how to measure it and how uh, whether it's sustainable materials. And I was mentioning that I feel like sustainability and, and usage of materials, it just depends on the, it, it's so individual for product. Um, because yeah. when you measure sustainability, you also measure the, the quality and overlasting of a material in a way, yeah. of a product. So it just depends, like there are th certain things that organic cotton will be perfect for, but there are, there are certain things that are just not, not good. Viable. Yeah. 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 And I think, well, I mean, I think this is, this is great. You know, I think this has brought up lots of issues. And actually what I will do is let's have a session. So Irina, I'm just putting this to you. Let's have a session where, you know, we talk about how to measure the carbon footprint and what does that mean? You know, what does it mean from source to gate? Uh, what is a supply chain? If we have a session on that, I think uh, that would be great. What do you think, Irina? Yeah, I think that uh, I think that we can do another discussion. And uh, I mean, for sure, uh, there is a lot more to discuss, to debate, to exchange opinions and um, share experiences, obviously, information. Uh, it's very dynamic industry and dynamic time for the for the sustainability industry i think so yeah let's let's think about it more precisely and um and put it all together and um, brilliant i mean on my side i just want to say a huge thank you to um to savitri and to absolutely everybody who joined for your questions yes. great and very interesting um conversation um, Here, it's so good to see you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's always good to see you. Um, <laughs> honestly, I mean, Noah, you're such an activist. Um, it's it's very inspiring. Honestly, you are the face out there, and people know and listen to, and they have good reason for that. Honestly, um, I um, I did post um, a link. Uh, I don't know if everybody can see it. Yeah. If you want yeah. to have. Uh, more questions and the feedback and please can you share your thoughts and any any discussion topic we can create a, a new um a new chat for that or new format um uh, would be would be great to hear your feedback share it with friends we will try to make this video available later so there will be an opportunity for those who were not able to join us today but maybe carry on this discussion um in the maybe um, email exchange, message exchange in format. Um, I'd like to, to show something. I, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm um, talking about biomimicry. I prepared these flowers from the garden I, and I kept looking how fascinating the color pattern nature creates. Um, yeah. And I kind of virtually would like to give those flowers to Savitri today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's um, so lovely. Um, I'm really thrilled. I'm really thrilled. I need to say I'm thrilled to be amongst people who are on the same wavelength and really beginning to challenge companies within the fashion industry and saying, you cannot do this anymore. You know, we are, in, we are an intelligent consumer. You've got to go beyond this. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, so thank uh, you. And uh, everybody, please... Uh, Follow us, follow from your, uh, we as a brand who is also trying to do our contribution to something beautiful um, in the fashion world, sustainable. Uh, this time out series, we will carry on. We will have a lot uh, more other talks as well. So please follow us. Um, and again, thanks to everyone and particularly today. I thank you to um, Savitri for this great talk and your time, um, your time with us. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah, everybody, have bye -bye. a great day.